Thanks so much. I can hear the clapping from here. And though with an introduction like that, I don't even know if I can live up to that. I don't know what that's about. Uh, one of the things that did not get popped up in that introduction, clicking link, there we are. Uh, I'm also the chair of the marketing chair of ATAP. So if you want to show off your TA pride, there's a little store that has some designs to kind of show off your pride. So take off, take your little uh, pocket supercomputer, some people call it a phone, and click at that QR code and go to the link. It's also in the uh, the navigation up top. There's all sorts of designs, t-shirts, bags, uh, mugs, stickers, the whole kit caboodle. I mean, can you imagine how much fun it would be to walk into your, your boss's meeting with a mug that says talent acquisition grows businesses? I mean, come on, you gotta have that. You gotta have that. So after this presentation, go take a look at that. So let's get to the matter at hand. Uh, I made some adjustments to the title here because I think ultimately, this is what matters. Employer branding is for everyone. That's really what it's about. I'm a big, big believer that it, employer brand is democratic, that it is completely open for everyone to access. And today I want to prove how that's possible, that every single company can and should be taking advantage of their employer brand. And we'll start with this horrible, horrible thought that the Washington Monument is in fact falling apart. That the, the limestone, the marble cladding on the monument, as well as those of the, the Jefferson and the Lincoln Memorials, they're all kind of falling apart. It turns out we're using some pretty harsh chemicals to scrub these monuments because, and this is the funniest thing I'm going to do today, uh, they're covered in bird poop. Yes, they're covered in bird poop. And why are they covered in bird poop? And for those of you counting, that's the third time I got to say that. So there you go, uh, in front of a crowd. Why are they covered in bird poop? Because... They're covered in bugs. They got midges, they got spiders, they got gnats. It is effectively like a birdie picnic table and someone has rung the bell. Why is it covered in spiders? Why is it covered in gnats and bugs? Well, because it turns out at night we light this thing up. It's like a blood zapper, except without the zapping part, which is unfortunate. It's a glowing, glowing obelisk of white and the bugs go, that's where I wanna be. Like a moth to a flame, not even a little proverbially. This is what attracts the bugs. And it turns out that the cost to fix these problems, to get the cladding fixed is about $25 million and will take three years to complete. That's not actually the biggest problem. The problem is they're gonna have to do it again in 10 to 15 years. Now, this is interesting because it turns out that while you will definitely need to do some fixing to the limestone and the marble, there might be an alternate solution. Rather than paying $25 million every decade or so, what if you just turned down the lights? What if you just turned the lights on a little later in the day? And that's in fact what they did. And it turns out that if you just make some minor adjustments to how you're lighting these things, to the kinds of lights you're using, uh, the timing you use, the, 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 the amperage and the, 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 the level of lighting you're using, dramatically decreases the bugs it attracts, which dramatically decreases the amount of bird poop, which dramatically lowers the need for really harsh chemicals. Now I bring this up because it turns out it's a very human thing to see a big problem and assume it requires a very big solution, that there's a kind of a, a trade-off factor. There's kind of a one-to-one -one correlation. Big problems always require big solutions. And, and I don't agree with that. And I'm, I'm, I'm fully aware of the line that says for every big messy problem, there's a simple creative solution that's wrong. I get that. And I'm not saying that every big problem has a simple solution. But I am saying is that it's natural for us in the TA space as human beings to look at the mess of recruiting, how hard it is to recruit, how hard it is to hire, how hard it is to attract great talent and ask ourselves, is there a simpler solution? Is there a creative solution? Or do we have to have the big solution? So I'm James Ellis. This is what I do. I'm here to bring the power of employer branding to every single company. Uh, by the way, for those of you who care, I just released my most recent book. There it is. There's my picture uh, on paperback. So it's 14 bucks. So I have two of them. So <laughs> go to get those books. Here's the thing. We have these challenges in hiring and we think, okay, maybe employer branding can help. But many of us have priced employer branding out. And I wish I had access to chat right now because I would love to ask you, give me the numbers you've seen. Don't give me names. I don't want to know who pitched what, but I'd love to see numbers. What is the price tag you were pitched or projected or uh, promised when you said, you talked to somebody and said, I need help with my employer brand. 
whether that was an agency or a consultant or a tech stack or whatever that was, someone quoted you a very big number, maybe not 25 million, but it was a very big number because we all know employer brands really complicated. It's really hard stuff. Maybe. It's not true that you need to think about employer branding as a big, big solution because it limits what employer branding can and should do. The thing is, is that if you, if you assume everything like that has a big price tag, it keeps us from thinking smartly and cleverly and creatively about how to solve these problems. And worst of all, it prices 95, 99% of companies out of the market. They can't afford these massive price tags. And so they shrug their shoulders and go about doing things the way they usually have and continue to fall behind. And that's not what this is about because employer brand is incredibly powerful. And I assume you know that. I hope you know that. If you don't know that, I mean, I'm not here to explain how incredibly powerful employer branding is. I don't do that anymore. I don't feel the need to do that anymore. If you want to hear from 50 employer brand professionals and practitioners, their firsthand account of how employer brand made dramatic impacts on their company, take out your pocket supercomputer and take a picture of that code. Go look at the actual ebook of people talking about how employer brand made massive changes to their company. Don't listen to me. Listen to them. Okay. The thing is, when we're thinking about employer branding, we have that perception that it's a big, big solution. We've seen the price tags. We've seen the proposals. We've seen the work that gets done. We've seen you know, the decks that are 4,000 slides long. We think that, that these are big solutions. And I think it's because we have some fundamental misunderstandings as to what employer branding is, how it works, and how we should approach it. And that's what I want to talk about today. There are three core misunderstandings here that I want to kind of resolve a little bit to help you see opportunities that right now you might not. Okay. So the first misunderstanding is that we don't understand the purpose of employer brand. Now, if I were to, to, to poll, I don't know, a hundred TA leaders and ask them, what's the value of employer branding? What's the purpose of employer branding? The number one answer, if this was the family feud, the number one answer on the board is going to be, a fill my pipeline or fill the top of my funnel or attract more candidates or attract more applicants, whatever that is. It's a sense of how do I get more people into my process? That employer branding is the way of attracting lots of people. And that is incorrect. The purpose of employer branding is not to attract applicants. The purpose of employer branding is to make great potential hires intrigued and interesting in what you have to say. Right? I, you don't want more applicants. That's not what the game of recruiting is all about. Though, frankly, it seems like it's become that, right? It feels like it's all become a game of how do I make more applications? Every tool set, all this AI stuff you're going to hear and say about, you know, so far and probably even more for the rest of the day, so much of it's designed about how do I write more stuff so I can spam more people so I can get more applicants? Well, did you want to hire any of those people? Maybe. I don't know. That's not very useful. Employer brand allows you to get really, really specific on what you're trying to say because you're being super, super specific on who you actually want to talk to, right? If you're standing in front of a room at a party and there's 100 people in that room and one person is a potential hire, someone who's amazing, and you stand in the room and you say, I want everyone to have a really positive impression about my company, to do that to a room full of 100 people, remember 99 of whom you have no interest in hiring whatsoever, you are going to say some fairly generic stuff. We're a great, wonderful place to be. We do good work. Our people are nice. Our people are wonderful. We have a great culture. Look at our values. These are generic things to say. But when we focus on the person we actually want to hire, we get off the dais and stop trying to talk to 100 people. And we walk straight up to that person we want to talk to and say, and have a conversation and say the things that we think they care most about, which may not be having a wonderful place to work, whatever that means today, or having a great culture, which is never properly defined, but saying, look, we understand what you're about. We have a sense that what you're looking for is more impact or more opportunity or a better boss or a better whatever. And then to say, we offer that. And I'd like to talk to you more about that. Because the goal is not to make everybody like you. The goal is to make the person you want to hire interested in learning more. 
And that comes from the power of focus to get super, super clear on what you offer and super, super clear on who that would be attractive to. You all offer standard coteries of benefits, at least here in the U.S. In, in, in EMEA, it's a different ballgame, obviously. But here in the U.S., you offer health insurance. You offer paid time off. You, maybe it's unlimited. Maybe it's a certain number of days. Maybe it's a certain number of hours. Whatever. You have a standard set of benefits. Most companies have them. In fact, almost every company that offers full-time work offers these benefits. And yet we go to our career site and we post, we offer full benefits. We offer full medical, full dental. As if that makes you different, as if that's interesting, as if that's useful knowledge. That is speaking to the room of a hundred rather than the one person. And the truth is you offer a lot of stuff that most people don't want. <laughs> to be perfectly blunt. And that's fine. I'm not saying you're a bad person or a bad company, not even remotely. I'm saying that even the most attractive person in the world is not attractive to everyone. You cannot be interesting to everyone. And the more you try to be interesting to everyone, the more you're boring to everybody. It's really about finding what you offer, who cares about what you offer and connecting the dots. And when you create that focus, Employer branding is making recruiters' jobs just a little easier. I will never, ever, ever, ever say that it will make a job, recruiter's job easier. That's not possible. It doesn't make anybody's job easy. Recruiters cannot be made, job, those jobs cannot be made easy. But it can introduce a little more oil in the machinery. It can attract more of the people you actually want to talk to instead of having to, you know, churn through a thousand applications, if you're lucky, right? but people who actually you'd consider hiring, that you'd be proud to take to your hiring manager who get what you have to offer. That's what it's about. The second big misunderstanding is the shape of employer branding. That we assume employer branding has to come in uh, a box <laughs> effectively. That's a little proverbial, but here, it's not about being a tactic, right? There's a, a very well-known company whose name I don't feel like knowing who made their entire business telling you that their reviews that created a score was your employer brand. And if you had an employer brand problem, the answer was make the number go up. And that's not true, not even remotely true, right? At best, making that number go up is a function of setting proper expectations, right? If you tell people this is an amazing place to, to work, that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, you get roses every day and puppy dogs swing by your desk every Thursday for kisses and, and there's tickle fights, it's wonderful, it's great. And you show up and there's no tickle fights, you're like, oh, I'm a little disappointed. I didn't get what I was promised. Three stars. If you say this is a company that's really, you know, we value hard work. We work long hours because we know it's getting us where we want to go. Maybe it's going to Mars. Maybe it's inventing a new blah, blah, blah. Whatever that thing is, we do hard work and the work is not easy, but we do it for a reason. Five stars, because that's exactly what they encountered. So employer brand isn't a tech stack. It isn't a tactic. It shouldn't involve turning you into a cheerleader. Remember, you're not trying to get the room full of hundreds of people to be excited to see you. You're trying to get real specific in sparking an emotion in the person you actually want to talk to, the person you actually want to hire. Now, while Titanic remains one of the top 10 movies by gross, right? Not everybody sees that movie and has an emotional connection with it, right? It's a pretty, it's a nice movie. I have no problems with it, but one, Jack could have totally fit on that, that, that plank or the door or whatever it was, but two, it's designed to make a certain audience cry. And that audience is not me. And that's fine. And that's why it's successful. It knows who it's trying to talk to, and it speaks directly to them in things that spark an emotional connection. Knowing full well there's a huge audience that will never feel that way, that will never have that emotional connection. It doesn't need to. You do not need all 8 billion people to watch your movie to make it successful. You need to speak to the 0.00001% of that audience who get what you're talking about, who will fall in love with what you're trying to say. This means we need to think about employer branding well beyond the twin pillars of tech stack and reach. And I think so much of employer brand is couched in terms of how do we do this with a tech stack? How do we get as many people as possible? And I think that's the wrong approach. It doesn't work. Again, you can't be attractive and interesting to everybody. You have to be super specific, which means defining a strategy, understanding what you're willing and who you're willing to say no to. So much of strategy is simply saying, uh, I don't need to talk to them. They're not the people I want. 
it's not interesting, it's not useful to engage with them. Once we ignore them, we have more time to talk to the people we actually care about. I actually talked about that on LinkedIn today. Somebody had a, actually Facebook. There's a Facebook group that says the reason why recruiters are always busy is because they're always, you know, no one ever tells them no and everybody gives them stuff to do. And I think the reason recruiters are so busy is because no one's helped them define a strategy. Don't talk to everybody. Figure out who it's important to talk to and focus more of your energies in that direction. Again, I'm not going to tell you I'm making recruiters jobs easy, but I can make it a little easier. What is that audience going to care about? What engages them? What, what, what gets them excited? What grinds their gears? What turns their engine? Whatever metaphor you want to use, go for it. It doesn't matter. But what do they want? Ultimately, we have the conversation around recruiting that it's all about money. It's all about what's the salary can, we can offer. And the only reason it's fallen to that level is because we haven't provided regular compelling cases of what we offer. Recruiting and hiring is a function of saying nice things. We present this positive impression, right? We, we invest in our candidate experience, right? To make sure everybody looks happy. Everybody has a positive impression, a little white glove action. Everybody feels good, but we're not speaking to them directly. We're just glossing over things. We say things like, oh, well, we're super innovative. Well, what does that mean? We're super innovative. End of conversation. The candidate is asked, in fact, expected to do their own digging, to figure out what do they mean by innovative, to ask questions in the interview, to do further research. And that's why they're forced to look up, you know, former employees and look up those reviews because they're not getting information from you. They see these claims that are not well proven and they don't know what to believe. And in the process, the only thing that is actually a tangible, believable thing is the number on the offer letter. And so... You've shrunk the battlefield to that one number, and consequently, everybody's going to fight over it. That said, if they knew they were getting a fair salary, and they knew they were getting twice as much innovation in a way that they understood, or twice as much status in a way that mattered to them, or twice as much autonomy in a, in a, in a form that made sense to them, they're more than happy to forego a massive pay boost because they're getting something that matters to them. And we think we're offering that, but we're not being credible with that. We're not being clear with that. It doesn't speak to them because we're trying to speak to the audience of 100. And the lesson here is that the way you get someone interested is not by spending a lot of money, because it turns out that being interesting is free. You just have to be willing to be interesting. And for the most part, we don't let TA teams be interesting. Now, I've met a lot of TA professionals, and most of them are incredibly interesting. And yet, when I see them engage the candidates, it's like they put this mask on and they turn into somebody else. And I go, no, 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 you were really interesting five minutes ago. What happened here? What did you do? They're not given license because they're not given strategy because they don't understand the brand they're trying to represent. They're being generic, not interesting. The third misunderstanding is scale, that we have to think about employer brand as this massive project that has to engage every single employee, that has to get leadership's buy-in, that has to involve a massive price tag, that it comes with all these bells and whistles. I beg to differ. I'm a big believer that idea of proportionality, the idea that every big problem has an equally expensive solution, doesn't have to be the way. It is a way, certainly. You can solve your employer branding problems by spending a lot of money in, in a smart way, but it's not the only way. You can make huge impacts to how people perceive your company using small things. Disproportionate impacts should be your watchword. Don't believe me? I get that. Whatever. But I am going to prove it to you. You ready? Here we go. Here's one project which you care about deeply and three simple free things you can do immediately to create an obvious impact. Now, we're going to talk about job postings. And if you've already listened to Katrina talk about job postings, please understand that I regard Katrina as the job posting person. There is no one I listen to more than Katrina when it comes to job posting. I think Mick Sullivan's got a lot of good stuff to say. I think there's a lot of people who have good to say, good stuff to say, but Kat me, Katrina knows. This is not in replacement of anything they said earlier. This is a way of looking at your job postings to say, how can I make major impacts for almost no investment. So there's three things you're going to, th three things you're going to do, not four, three. 
Here's the first one. Cut the number of bullets in half. Just do it. You and I both know that most of your job postings are full of unnecessary, repetitive, bullshit bullets. Get rid of them. You need an arbitrary number? Fine. Cut half out. Get rid of stuff that says, here, I I saw a job posting for a lawyer recently, and it says, must have a college degree, must have a a bar, um, uh, have passed the bar exam and be certified as a lawyer. You don't need the first two to get, if you get the third, you don't need to say those things. If you've, if you, if you're licensed to practice law, you have gone to school, you have passed the test. What are you saying? You're just filling up space. Now, it's just an obvious example, but most of our job postings are filled with junk. And we all know, we all know the statistics around how men and women perceive those requirements differently. We all know you do not need me to tell you these things. So cut them in half. Step two, rewrite them in a very simple way. Connect the task or the skill that you're talking about to the impact that task or skill is going to have. For example, do not say we look for, you know, we require someone with intermediate Excel experience because that means nothing. What does intermediate mean in Excel? What does it mean? Does it mean I know how to open it and I know how to move from cell to cell? Does it mean I know how to write a basic formula? Does it mean I know what a VLOOKUP table is? Does it mean I can code macros in it? I don't know. And neither do you. (laughs) It's the problem. Instead of saying requires intermediate Excel experience, you could write will use pivot tables in Excel to identify leads. Well, whoa, now it's it's the same thing, right? Except it's saying so much more. It's saying why Excel matters. The part of Excel, which by the way, is a massive program, can do a million different things. What is the part you care about? You do not care about Excel as a concept. You care about leveraging data in Excel via a pivot table, to extract information that you can use. That's what you care about. So write it like that. Don't say requires excellent written and spoken communication or worse, oral communication. No, don't say that. Just don't use the word oral. Please don't. Instead, you can say, you're going to spend a lot of time writing slacks, communicating clearly in emails to a team located around the world. That is way more useful information than must be an excellent written communicator, which again, are you writing a novel? Maybe, I don't know what that bullet means. Third thing, put a headline on that thing, people. They're not tech specs, they're commercials. So treat them as such. Now, when I say a headline, some of you will think, oh, I do, I say the title of the job, and then I say how much it is an hour, and it's a third shift. That's not what I'm talking about. That is not a headline. A headline is a simple, let's call it a 10 word, roughly 10 to 12, 10 to 15 word reason to read the rest of the job posting. Not what the salary is, not what shift it is, not why it's an amazing opportunity, none of that garbage. Why should I read the next paragraph? Why? I just went on Indeed. I just went on LinkedIn. I typed in a job title and there's 4,000 options. Why click yours? Just write one. Keep it simple. Don't have to be comprehensive. You don't even have to be a copywriter. You just get super clear on what you're looking for and why someone should want to learn more. And the best part is, is that costs you exactly nothing. And I can guarantee with all the money I got in my pockets right now against all the money you have in your pockets, that if you do this for your job postings, it won't be a month before you see a difference. It'll be days, days before you see obvious changes in who you're attracting, how good a quality candidate they might be, what they're saying, what they're asking interviews, what they're interested in. It moves mountains and it doesn't have to cost a massive amount of money. Because ultimately, every single company has an employer brand, and they should be using, and they can be using it to take advantage of what makes them unique. There is no such thing as a good employer brand or a bad employer brand. There are strong ones and weak ones, but there's no such thing as a good one because ultimately, there is no such thing as a good company. There's a good fit. There's a lid for every pot. But how is a lid am I supposed to be able to find the right pot if the pot sounds like every other single pot I've ever heard of? It's about being crystal clear and 
because it's something every company can use. And I, when I say every, I mean every single company. I mean, I don't care what size you are. I don't care if you're 20 people. I don't care if you're 20,000 people. I don't care if you're in a, what, uh, what industry you're in. I don't care if you're a, in a really uncool, unsexy company. I don't care if you make bottle caps for, for your business. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're a regulated industry or you're a bank or a pharma or a biotech or whatever, every single company has an employer brand and can and should be using that employer brand. All right. I am technically at 1030 and I am at time. Thank you so very much for attending. Thank you so much for being a part of, of Global Talent Acquisition Day. As the marketing chair, it is thrilling to see that more than 1200 people signed up for these sessions. I hope you're getting something out of it. If not from me, then certainly from some of the other amazing people we have speaking. If you're interested in what ATAP does, check out the website, learn about the benefits, and you will be legitimately stunned what a $99 membership will get you. Trust me, stunned. All right. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And uh, I'm around. Happy to talk. Talk to you later.